<laughs> Keep your Bibles open there to 1 Peter. These sets of verses that I picked this morning, um, if you to look at them and really think about it and try to live your life according to them, kind of hard. Right? Sometimes we don't even want to look at those kind of verses. Just kind of bypass them. But I want you to see here what Peter is telling his writers. Last week we looked at the call to be submissive. To submit to those in authority. To submit to the authority that is over you, whether it's the authority of the local governments, whether it's the authority in the church, whether it's the authority on your job. That as Christians, you are called to submit to authority. Is that right? Amen. And now, these next set of verses uh, took me years to actually start to understand how to actually apply them to and you can't do it unless you understand the submissive part and the call to submission. Peter tells his readers here that what profit is it for a man if you're beaten, and that's what that word buffet means, if you're beaten for when you do wrong. Right? Because in his day, that's what would happen to you. You would be scourged. Okay? And he says, if you deserve it, and you take it patiently, what good is that? You deserve it. <laughs> but what is he telling his readers? It's when you're beaten and you don't deserve it, and you take that patiently, that is commendable before God. Amen. Now, we are so far away from that in our experience with God in this country that we have a very hard time to understand, you're going to beat me for doing the right thing? But this country is unique in most of the world. And we need to never forget that. There are Christians who are being called today to suffer for their faith. And that when they are mistreated, when they are abused, when they are beaten, God does not tell them to fight back. What does He tell them? To submit. And that as those blows are being laid upon your back, to submit to that. How hard is that for us to do? Now listen, brothers and sisters, just because you live in a country where you have freedoms and that physically doesn't happen to you, you are faced with these choices every day. How many are hot? Raise your hand. He got the message. Thank you, Donald. Well, I thought you were going to tell us to put up with it. <laughs> Thank God that you guys give to the local church budget and we can actually pay to, uh, our electric bill. And when it gets hot, you can turn the air. But what I want you to think about is in your life, whether you are young, whether you are old, whether you work, or whether you're retired, every day, there are things that happen that you are called to submit to. Is that right? Mm -hmm. All right. Whether it is, how many of you guys love talking to businesses on the phone that when you call them, you get the uh, automated system? Yeah. Raise your hand if you have patience with the automated system. <laughs> okay, raise your hand high because I want to see just how many there's two, three. There's a lot more than three people here, right? <laughs> There's one thing that will get my blood pressure up. It is the automated system. Because it never allows you to do what you want to do, right? Right. right? right. You want a specific thing, and they're asking you all these questions and prompting you to dial 1, 2, 3, 4, or whatever. And all you want to do is talk to a live person. Now, you used to be just had to press that little zero button. But man, they tricked you, because now they put it to the star key. Or they put it in as another number that makes you go through the entire prompt. And you know what happens? You can listen to half the prompt, press the zero button, 
and it brings you back to the beginning of the world. <laughs> you have to listen to the whole thing over again. So listen, by the time you get to the live person, you are so upset that you're not nice to that person because you want somebody to feel your pain. So those poor people that have those jobs, God has called you to be patient with them. That when you are beaten by the prompt thing, when they come on the phone, God has called you to be patient. We don't even think about that, do we? Now, do you understand that in our life and in our world today, that's what that verse means in your life? That's how you put it into place? Now, here you go. You're at the grocery store. You have two items in your hand. And a person in front of you is in the 10 items or less lane, and they've got 30 items, and they're only through item 15, and that's the only 10 items or less lane open, because it's Walmart. Walmart only puts four cashiers on at a time, if you're lucky, right? <laughs> so you've got to be somewhere, and you're looking at your watch, and the person in front of you is just going through that, and then at the end, then they take out their checkbook. Yeah. And then they start writing their checkbook. <laughs> right? Now, you may not say anything to that person, but you are there going, <sighs> <laughs> right? Now, that person hears that, and so does the cashier. Now, you may be one of those persons that actually say something. Like, did you not see the sign? How many items do you have? But what is God calling you for? Okay? This is how you interpret this verse in your life, and you live it out in our world and society today. But brothers and sisters, what we have as our freedoms won't always last. And there may come a time when you may live this verse out exactly how it states. Amen. If you can't deal with the prompt machine or the person in front of you that's taking three minutes out of your life, how are you going to deal with this? For real. Okay? There will not be one person who has lived on this planet who could stand before God and say, you don't know what my life was like. You don't know what I had to go through. Because when Jesus took on humanity and when he lived his life, he lived his life for every single person that lived so that he was able to taste everything that every person would ever go through. Now, I'm not saying he went through everything that every person goes through. But the Bible tells you that there is not one temptation that is common to man that he doesn't know about. Is that right? Amen. Why is that? Because in his humanity, in his human nature, he lived it and he overcame it. Praise God. Yes. And if he overcame, he gives you the opportunity and the power to overcome as well. Okay. And it only happens in him. That is why Paul, in all of his letters and all of his writings, has the same motif of being in Christ. The secret of our success is being in Christ. That Christ lives in me. It is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. Right? So, as you look at these next set of verses from Peter it says for let me actually read it from the New King James let's look at verse 17 first Peter tells us to what's that first word? Honor. it's in every version it's the same word honor all, all people now if you look you have the King James or the New King James, that word people is an italicized, right? In the King James, what does that mean? Does that mean it's an important word? It's a supplied word. It's not in the original. So Peter says to honor all. That's the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? That's all, not just those who are nice to you. Because Jesus said, what difference is it that if you only are nice to the people who are nice to you, or if you only like the people that are nice to you? Don't even the Gentiles do that? That's the way the world system is. But you as Christians are called for something else. 
and that is to love those that don't love you. Mm -hmm. To be nice to those who persecute you, abuse you. Honor all. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Servants be submissive to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and the gentle. Don't you wish he would have stopped right there? <laughs> but also to who? Harsh. Now how many of you, when you don't like your boss, because they're harsh, will work behind his back to uh, subvert his authority? <laughs> Or try to make that person look bad. You know what I'm saying? Isn't that what we do in our human natures? Christ has called you for so much more. This, brothers and sisters, is why I love the writings that are found in the Spirit of Prophecy. Because the Spirit of Prophecy takes these principles in Scripture and she expands on them. This is why a lot of people have a hard time with her writings. And this is why a lot of people think that she was a legalist. If you look at her writings, and you read them, and you read the Bible with it, and you start to understand where she's coming from, if God was to give you the job and the responsibility of preparing a people to meet Him when He comes, what would you tell them? Everything is okay. You don't need to change. You're good the way you are. But would you tell them, that the experience that you have today is not going to be good enough to get you through the time of trouble. Amen. That what you should be doing now is preparing, and if you can do it now when things are easy, how are you going to do it when things are hard? Amen. Can you imagine what she went through <coughs> in her life and experience? We're a hundred years plus past from when she died, and there's still great debate within the church of her writings, let alone what the rest of the world thinks of her. Yeah. Look on the internet. Okay? But if you take her writings and you understand the principles that she's talking about, she is talking about a relationship and a level of spirituality that this world does not know nor can it comprehend. Amen. And this is what you have been called for as Seventh day Adventist to be able to live that out so that the world can see it comprehend it, and embrace it. Praise the Lord. Are you willing and ready to do that? Amen. That's what we're here for, right? Are we here just because this church has the truth, and hey, as long as I got that truth, I'm good to go? Or are we here to be ambassadors for Christ, to prepare a world for His coming? Light and dark place. You ever wondered why all these things that has overtaken politics, all these divisive issues that are in our society and have gone around the world, why they are happening now and not a hundred years ago or even 50 years ago. If you don't think you live in the last days, look at the condition of the world. Look at what's being accepted as normal. Amen. Look at what's being taught to your children in school yes. as okay. And look at how they view you when you say this is wrong. This is immoral. Amen. The last days we will call evil good and good evil. Fifty years ago, do you think what's going on in the political system would be okay? No. No? Why is it happening today? Because these are the last days. If you do not see it, and if you're not preparing for that, there's going to be a time of trouble that will break up this world that you will not be prepared for. And if you're not prepared for that, then I haven't done my job. Amen. Thank you. Why do I continue to preach what I preach, how I preach. Some people don't like it. Some people would rather hear easier things to accept and an easier way to live by. Is that what Christ has called you for? No. Has He called you for the easy life? No. 
But yet, this is what America and American Christianity is all about. Amen. The easier it is, the more acceptable it is. I will not water down what God's Word says, nor will I water down what God has called me to do. And that is to stand here and to prepare a people for His coming. Amen. You're His people. This is my job. Amen. This is what the Word says. If I deviate from that, let me know. But if it, what's, if it is what the Word says, then you have to make a choice. You guys got your bulletins? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, turn to the back of that bulletin. You know, today's the first day we actually got to write on the back of the bulletin. <laughs> and it is a quote from Steps to Christ. Right? Yeah. Ricky, can you read that? Certainly. Many are inquiring, how am I to make, a, to make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to Him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Your promises and revo, revo, resolutions are like ropes of sand. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections. The knowledge of your broken promises and the forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God cannot accept you. But you need not despair. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man. Stop. For years we've been talking about what's God's part, what's our part. You've heard all different sides of that question. Amen. Here is the answer to that question. What's God's part and what's your part? God's part is to change you, to take what you cannot change because of your powerlessness in your sinful flesh and recreate in you a new person. What is your part? You control your will. Amen. This is why I say over and over and over again, it is your choice. That is your part. God does not make the choice for you. Amen. You will choose this day whom you will serve. Whether it is God or whether it is the devil. Because there's only two. Amen. Only two. You give your allegiance to God, to Christ, or if it's not through Him, then all the millions of other ways goes right back to Satan. And it is your will. If you give your will to God, then God will change you. Amen. But you can think you're giving your will to God, and actually you're not, because you still want to control everything. Amen. Continue on. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will, the power of choice God has given to men. It is theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give it give to God its affections. But you can choose to serve Him. You can give Him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do according to His good pleasure. Thus, your whole nature will be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon Him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with Him. Desires for goodness and holiness are right as far as they go. But if you stop here, they will avail nothing. nothing. Many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. They do not come to the point of yielding to the will, of, the will to God. They do not now choose to be Christians. Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in your life. By yielding up your will to Christ, you ally yourself with the power that is above all principalities and powers. You will have strength from above to hold you steadfast and thus throw constant surrender to God. You will be enabled to live the new life, even the life of faith. This is an insight that the churches need to understand. Amen. Because again, 
People have a problem with the spirit of prophecy because they say, I have to overcome all this stuff. And she made it plain right there, you can't overcome anything. Your heart is wicked. Even those of you who think you're good, you're not good. Your heart is wicked. The Bible says it's not just wicked, it's desperately <laughs> wicked. Who can know it? When God looks, does He look as man looks on the outside? How does God look at us? He right through it. He sees what the Bible says is our heart. What that means is He sees your motives. He sees the depths of the darkness that lies within you. And He knows that in and of yourself you cannot be saved. But He has made a way through His Son Jesus Christ. Amen. And in Christ you can be more than overcomers. Right? But how do you get from this point from here of I am lost with no hope to this point over here where I'm an overcomer in Jesus Christ? And how you get there is an act of your will. I choose this day to serve Jesus Christ. I choose this day to give Him my heart. And if I do that, then He will make all these changes in me. Does it happen in a moment? No. Right, understand that. So do not get discouraged when you don't see or feel the growth that you think you should have. If your heart is still yearning after Christ, if you still have remorse for your sin and you want a change, it's telling you that the Holy Spirit is still working in your life. Amen. Right? And that there's still hope. <coughs> Alright, so... Verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable. If because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Now, you have to take that into context that Peter wrote it. The verse before that, who was he talking to? Do you realize that in the early church, who were there more of? Rich people or slaves? <laughs> Christianity was a religion of slaves. Did you guys, did you guys realize that? Did you know that? And so when Peter writes, he knows the majority of the people that read his writings are in servitude. Servants get beaten. If they don't do the right thing, they can do the right thing and still get beaten, right? Because they are not their own. They belong to somebody else. So understand this. That when he writes this next verse, for this is commendable if because of conscience towards God you endure grief, suffering wrongfully. You are to be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle ones, but also to the harsh ones. For this is commendable if because of conscience towards God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Verse 20, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Verse 21. What's the title of this sermon? Look at you both. Christ our example. To this you are called. What were you called for? These are one of the texts in the Bible that are very hard to understand. Really? This is what I'm called for? Why couldn't I be called for riches? Prosperity? Uh, you know, fame? Fortune? What am I called for? Verse 21, For to this you were called. You were called to take suffering, grief, and wrongdoing with patience and endurance and submission. That's what you have been called for because Jesus promised you that in this life, if you follow Him, you will have persecutions and trials. To take it patiently. And it doesn't matter what country you live in, you will have trials and different sets of persecutions. Right? 
For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us a what? What's the example that Christ left us? An example of suffering and how to take it. Do you see that from the verses? Yes. Do you realize that's what you're called for? Yes. Most people don't want to hear that. Most people have a hard time digesting that. But as Christians, that is what we're called for. To show the world that through Christ, I can endure all things. And not by gritting my teeth and just, you know, trying to will it out. But I can have joy in the midst of pain. I can have joy in the midst of the trial. I can have joy that the world doesn't know nor understand in the midst of great suffering. Amen. Who gives me that joy? God. It is a relationship of Jesus Christ. And so the Holy Spirit living in you fills you with joy Amen. and happiness. Why is it important for Christians to come together? To not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. Why is it important? Well, right? it, we're encouraged to come together. For encouragement, right? Yeah. Now, raise your hand if nobody has any trials in their lives. <laughs> that you're not going to do anything bad. Raise your hand. Look around. Okay, anybody got their hand raised? Raise your hand if you know trial, if you are have some things in your life that cause you pain or suffering. Raise your hand. Raise your hand around because it's pretty much unanimous, right? So why do we come together? Because you can build my faith. Bob can build your faith. And as we draw together, we can take comfort knowing that God is working in your life. And if he loves you, then he loves me the same. And he can work in my life as well, right? And that if you need prayer, I know that I can come to you. And that you won't laugh at me or you won't talk behind my back. But you will pray for me. That you really have my best interest at heart. That is what church is supposed to be about. That is why we come together as a family. Because you help me to go out there into this world and be a Christian. Because they don't strengthen my faith, believe me. No. But when I come in here, you do. Right? Amen. Okay, so...